This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception in Action podcast, my interview with Kylie Steele, Senior Lecturer in the School of Science and Health at Western Sydney University in Australia. Hi everyone, welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Kylie Steele from Western Sydney University. Kylie received her PhD from Sydney University. She uses a diverse range of approaches to understand perception and cognition in skilled performance. In the interview, we discuss biological motion, what is it, and how can we apply it to sports, how important is it to be able to quickly recognize a teammate on the field or court? Do compression garments work, and if so, how? And how are skill acquisition professionals viewed by coaches and players? Hope you enjoy! Not ten years ago, I was a child. I was a good boy and you let me go. Now I'm on a talk show. Talk show. All right, so today my guest is Kylie Steele, Senior Lecturer in the School of Science and Health at Western Sydney University in Australia. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Kylie. That's a pleasure. To start off with, can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got interested in sports science? Well, I've always been interested in sport you know, a, a, as a kid and then, then as I got older, but from a tertiary point of view or from a career point of view, I always wanted to go into um, either physical education or sports science and kind of took a bit of a long route to get there. I'm actually from a country here in didn't want to move to the big city to do some of the human movement degrees, so I actually did an infant's primary degree at my local university, then a PE degree, and then taught for about seven to eight years and then thought, okay, it's time to actually do what I really wanted to do, which was sports science. So I then headed off to Sydney University and because I'd moved to Sydney by that stage and did my master's and then had a couple of years where I continued to teach and then got a job in tertiary education and then did my PhD at Sydney. So you kind of built up to it <laughs> along the way. I did, I, I did. I know a lot of people kind of mix the health, health science and sports science together. So, And I know some of the first work you did uh, was looking at how people can kind of detect and identify their teammates, right? How that's related to decision-making. Can you tell us a little bit about that work? The, the premise for that actually, I, I approached Dr. Roger Adams, who was one of my lecturers during my master's, and I said, I really want to do a PhD. And he really liked the idea of investigating something really novel. And um, being a boy from Adelaide, where AFL is, um, or Australian rules football is really huge, and also having an interest in the military, he kind of combined two ideas, and one actually evolved from listening to soldiers talking about running through or between trees and so forth in World War I and not needing to know verbally or by any other characteristic who the people running next to them were. They could actually tell who they were simply by the way they moved. The idea of being able to identify quickly without that verbal confirmation or even colour was quite interesting. He thought, why don't we bring this to sport? Because often in sport, you have to make decisions very, very quickly. And while we have uniforms to differentiate between teams, people still make mistakes and pass the ball to people on the opposite team, particularly if that person's a little bit obscured or they have to make the decision very quickly. So we started then looking at the idea of biological motion and so forth in the sports context and um, I guess extending that work by your hands and, and looking at it in a, a more applied way. Yeah, so for those that might not know, can you tell us a little bit about what biological motion is and kind of what information it can convey to a person? Essentially, biological motion is the movement of any living organism. But from a scientific point of view, I guess most of the time we're, we're interested in what information we can garner from human beings. And what we can uh, get from human beings is actually quite extensive and we can do it from a very early age. So we can get information related to the gender of the person. So, so assume that you can't actually see all of the, the, the defining characteristics like 
for example, long hair or um, you may not have seen them that day, so you don't know what they're wearing and you might see someone from a distance. So it's more their outline or silhouette. But from that, you can actually determine their gender, who they are, that is whether they're someone you know or don't know. You can determine their intention, whether it's deceptive or friendly. You can also determine confidence, sexiness. There's a lot. There's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So in your study, you were seeing how well people can recognize, identify a person as a teammate based purely on the pattern of motion they're occurring. So did you, you took away all the uniforms and all the other information and Absolutely. And are people pretty good at it with members of their own team? We found in our initial studies that most people could do it at levels significantly above chance, but no one could do it at 100% accuracy, Mm -hmm. including when we worked with children. And even when we took the study into a swimming gate, say with water polo players, where, where their views often obscured far more than someone running, We still found that people could do it at a relatively good rate, but I think what we're most interested in is the people who can't do it. So the people who can't do it are more likely to make mistakes and pass the ball to someone else, which might then lead to that team scoring and so forth. So, And once you get to Olympic level, obviously that's (laughs) that's an issue. So when you were applying this, were you actually training these people to, to get better at it? There's actually been a couple of training studies. The first one we did, which was actually part of my PhD, we actually found that the the, the method we used didn't actually work. And it may have been because the training footage was captured from a very different angle to the test footage. So I haven't been quite able to deter, and I often revisit that study to sort of have another look. But I've also had an honours student, Ethan Ellen, he's actually, um, well, he's actually now my PhD student and extending this work. He actually found with trying to teach people to recognize via movement that he could actually do it when you give people only about 200 milliseconds of information per movement per person. And after a couple of weeks, that let's, let's say 20 minutes training in the first week and then every week thereafter for one, for one session a week for four weeks. He found they could do that quite significantly. So... The difference, probably the difference between what Ethan's done and what I did was that the training footage is very similar to the test footage. Mm -hmm. So it's a similar view. So it does tell me that people, we can train people to do this, but the question becomes what's the most effective way? Because if you, another area we want to take this research is, or that we've been trying to, is more in a military friendly fire context. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in sport, okay, someone might score a goal, might might win a match, but in a friendly fire situation, it can be a life and death situation. So trying to sort of emulate maybe more realistic training scenarios that might decrease the incidence of friendly fire is something that we'd really like to, to investigate. But whether that's done via video or something else, we're not quite sure. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. So in your studies, are people making these judgments kind of in per, in the peripheral vision or kind of in the center or in both? In the center. Okay. That, that, that would be interesting because some of those cues that you, obvious ones like color and things are not going to be as effective in peripheral vision, right? You're going to have to rely on those motion cues. So I know another kind of area you've, mm-hmm. you've looked at is something that's near and dear to me is simulation training. So mm-hmm. um, I, I think you've done a study on figure skating training with, with a simulator. Can you tell us a bit about that? It wasn't so much simulation training. It was actually an extension of the biological motion work in the sense that we were trying, we thought, well, if people in running sports could do it and people in swimming sports could do it, could it be done with ice hockey Mm -hmm. where they're wearing quite extensive uniforms? Many other features are covered up, for example, facial features and the, the shape of their body. And we actually found these guys were uh, less able to do it um, compared to others. But we still only gave them about 400 milliseconds of information. And in that space, 
they didn't move a lot. There was a lot of gliding where in running and swimming you'll get a lot more movement. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether in that context you might need, say, you know, a full second of information so you can see more of their movement. That study was extending the work. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess when you're in the middle of a glide, you're not much going on in to, to identify yourself. And also, it's very fast speed too. Yes. So, no, that's really interesting. So, I know another thing you were looking at, one of the, th I was reading one of your papers that's really interesting is looking at kind of the role of skill acquisition specialists kind of in sports and looking at how they're viewed. Can you tell us a little bit about that work you've done? Yeah, that, that, that came about from sort of my observation here in Australia where we actually have, and my understanding is we, we do this quite well from talking to people overseas and so forth. That is, we actually have Damien Farrow, who you probably know, who um, was heading up the Australian Institute of Sport in a, a specialist role, really supporting motor learning, I guess, for the first time. And he built, he's contributed to building a department there that now actually has a few people, including Derek Panchuk and, and so forth, who actually work with athletes. The interesting thing about that is that most of the other sports institutes within each state don't have someone who works in this area, with probably the exception of Queensland and maybe Victoria, and also sports like the Australian Rules Football League. They're actually starting to embrace the idea of someone who helps with skills. But one of the things I observed was that as soon as you mention something like a, um, a skill acquisition specialist, people go, oh, that's a skills coach. Mm -hmm. And it automatically seemed to step on coaches' toes. So what I then thought was, okay, let's have a look and, and see what coaches understand to be a skill acquisition coach. And most of them, including athletes, thought, okay, they're a skills coach rather than a sports scientist who, like a physiologist or biomechanist, et cetera, helps them come up with strategies or ideas or even just helps them understand why they do what they do so they can do it better. So I guess the idea behind those studies was very much to highlight the disconnect we have with what that role is and maybe look at how we can change that so the role of skill acquisition specialists could be embraced a little bit more by the practical or the applied communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know when I was in the UK, we were kind of talking a similar thing and actually trying to create a subspecialty within like sports psychology of skill acquisition so is it, is you think it's more a kind of a lack of understanding of what a skill acquisition person can do? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think also, I love the name that they've come up with, you know, skill acquisition specialist. I, I think as a sports scientist, that sort of really represents what we do in this area. Unfortunately, though, I think the use of the word skill seems to bring confusion for coaches because I don't know what it's like elsewhere, but in Australia, we do have you have your coach, but then you might have a coach who then specialises in kicking or um, defence or something like that. So, again, they see their role as very much working with skills. So if you then have a sports scientist who uses the word skill in their name, they kind of think, hang on, that's what I do. So maybe we've got to do a bit of work at our end to try and sort of help these pr professionals understand that we're actually not there to tread on their toes. We're there to um, support yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. I see a variety of different. I've heard the role of sports scientist on teams. Sometimes it's it's basically a strength and conditioning coach, um, which is you know it's fine, but that's that's a different thing. And then I've also seen where basically people are just summarizing data and presenting yeah. it, and they're called a sports scientist, which that's not what I think of. Right? They're not really making yeah, any absolutely. recommendations about performance or anything like that. So, so is that something you're continuing? Was that kind of uh, surveys you were doing of coaches and athletes to try to understand that? Yes, that was very much a survey interview approach. I haven't actually done, I, I did a couple of studies in that and, and haven't done any more though. I continue to observe sort of what's happening from afar, but I think it's more that I found uh, my research was starting to get a little bit diverse. <laughs> I have the same problem. Everything sounds interesting. So so have you tried to focus mainly on kind of the biological motion and or, or what other kinds of things are you working on now? I've got a, a PhD student who's uh, extending the biological motion work. 
I'm also supervising another student, Nathan Washington, who is look, extending the compression garment work that we've done with footballers, but he's looking at it more in the sense of we're, we're pairing it back to some basic movements in more of a like a gym setting, like a vertical jump, a leg press and so forth, because we want to investigate what aspects of the garments might be useful is it the material around the knee or is it material around the muscles? Is it the long leg garment that's better than the short leg garment and so forth? I meant to ask you about that work because I, I, I wear those when I run. So so you were looking at uh, not for recovery so much, but whether they actually facilitate performance. What have you found with that? So we did a balance. We used balance as one of our movements and we actually found those who are wearing the properly fitted garments – so according to the industry and um, the company suggestion as to what the right size was, they did better than people who are wearing a looser fit. So having the, the correct fit is really important. It certainly gives you more information than, say, wearing your, your running shorts or whatever the case might be. Uh, when we did the Australian Rules football study, we were looking at kicking and we found when they were wearing the tight, tight fit garment, they actually did just a little bit better. Interesting, interestingly on that, um, Roger Adams, who I mentioned previously, who was my PhD supervisor, he actually did a study a few years before I did with another student, Matt Cameron, which involved the Sydney Swans, which is one of our AFL teams. And they actually found the more able players got worse with skill when using the, the garments compared to the less abled athlete, um, where we sort of didn't quite find that. But our, our skills were a little bit different in that, in, you know, in the complexity of them and so forth. So I guess we're wondering, maybe with more able athlete, it provides too much information when they've solidified the information that they need for movement mm -hmm. um, so it might confuse the system where novices who are still learning provides extra information that might help them make movement decisions yeah it's, it's that's that sort of stuff that we want to look at does it have a, a use for skill learning even in basic movements well that's really interesting so you think it might be help giving kind of proprioceptive feedback from the muscles and, and, and tendons. And, yeah. and We've done balance, but now we're going to try and do some slightly more explosive strength-based exercises. Now, the idea came from Kenneth Graham, Dr. Kenneth Graham, who heads up research at the New South Wales Institute of Sport, who I've known and worked with for a number of years. And it was an observation he made with the athletes who were wearing the garment that they had at the time, which was IT sports. They now have two times you, but because it was such an, a nice firm fit, when they were wearing it, they felt stronger. Mm -hmm. So whether that was more perceptual as opposed to factual, we don't know. But it was what triggered the idea to sort of have a look at these. So we found some interesting things thus far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting line of research. So how do you control the kind of placebo or psychological effects that you know these kind of uh, compression garments might have on people? I guess it is hard to, uh, to get rid of that psychological effect. With the people that we have been testing, they weren't people who were N Swiss athletes, so they had never been introduced to this particular garment, which was actually a very, very good garment, but much firmer, I guess, in its support than a lot of other garments at the time. So they weren't used to having something that was so firm, so I guess they probably didn't think really about the psychological component of it. But we did sort of measure the material and the strength of the material and, and really just got them to focus on performing the task rather than anything else. That probably is something that we'd need to work on with Nathan, you know, some some way of measuring the perception of whether it improves performance as opposed to the does it actually mm -hmm. improve performance. Yeah. No, that's a tricky. I've <laughs> dealt with that myself. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a really interesting line of research and I guess, you know, you've talked about it a little bit, but I guess it's kind of the last question I was going to have for you is what kind of other current and future work how, do you have going on? I noticed you're doing some, you're doing some other health related work as well. There's two other areas that I'm working on at the moment. One is I'm trying to come up with some talent identification tests that are much more perceptual, cognitive in nature, as opposed to the wonderful ones that we have at the moment, which are, you know, you're tall, therefore you're talented, or you've got a good vertical jump, therefore you're talented. So we want to sort of take it more into that skills 
area. So we're looking at that with the Greater Western Sydney Giants AFL Club. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's new. We've only been working on that for a few months. So I'll update you on that if we actually find anything. The other area that I've been working on is video self-modelling. Now, in that, again, we started with AFL and kicking, but then I've taken it into stroke Mm -hmm. patients just with a reach and grasp to see if watching video or best performances of a reach and grasp could improve their performance, and we found some improvement. And then we thought, well, okay, let's take this into another group that has a movement deficit. So we want to investigate it with cerebral palsy participants but we've spent the last six months trying to recruit and it has just proved impossible for some reason. So we haven't, we've got one person on the cards. Mm -hmm. So we might actually look at some functional tasks there. So, you know, um, that is self-selected by that person. And so it might be they want to improve being able to put on a shirt. Mm -hmm. So we'd film them putting on a shirt several times, determine which is the best example and then show them video only of that best example. It is really interesting because it's a really non-invasive method. It only takes a couple of minutes of training a day, and it's something, given the accessibility of iPhones and iPads, they could really just get a a family member, carer or friend to film them doing the task and quickly edit, and then they can watch it Mm -hmm. daily until they've improved, hopefully, Mm -hmm. and then maybe update the video to an even better one. So Peter Darrick and, um, uh, has had a lot of success in the educational behavioural setting and Diane St. Marie uh, up in Canada is having some success as well in movement. So yeah, this rehabilitation movement setting for video self-modelling is not one that's been explored extensively. Mm-hmm. So that's an area that uh, a few of us are looking at. Oh, great. That's really interesting. So for the perceptual cognitive tests, are you going to try to use them as predictive of another test battery kind of thing? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think another observation I've made, and it, it may be just restricted to Australia, I'm not sure, but within the athletic selection process here, they do often look at size. They'll often look at someone, okay, they're tall, they're very muscular, they've got a great arm span, whatever the case might be. But they never look at the capacity for the person to actually learn skills or make decisions within the high-pressure situation or what their anticipatory skills are like. Okay, so I think that's all the questions I have. So thank you for taking some time to talk with me, Kylie. Absolute pleasure. Thanks again for the great discussion, Kylie. I'm really interested to see how you're going to continue to apply biological motion stimuli. I've always thought they were an underused tool. You can find out more about Kylie's work through the links I've posted in the show notes. Coming soon on the Perception in Action podcast, a look at the very first sports psychology experiment. Does cycling in a group have more benefits than just drafting? This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now. We'll cut you quick.